Welcome to Midnight Menu Plus One. I'm Ray Kanata. And I'm Margo Moss. We're here at Heads Frost Top on Claiborne and Calhoun in uptown New Orleans. Once a week, Margo and I meet here at Ted's and we invite a member of New Orleans restaurant and food community to join us. And we invite them to bring along a friend, a plus one. We never know who their plus one's going to be. It could be a friend, a neighbor, family member, um, lawn guy, uh, pool man, all kinds of people, for, uh, fellow business, uh, restaurant business colleague. Uh, we'll, we'll find out in just a moment. But we'll be talking with our special guest. We know who that is. And this is going to be a midnight menu first. Did you know this, Margo? No. We've what? had, um, what have we had? We've had all kinds of different restaurant uh, permutations, right? We've had uh, high end, low end, and everything in between. We've had prison chefs and, uh, you know, uh, med school professors and all kinds of people. But we've never had a coffee shop person on our show yet. And that's so important. And so it'll be, that'll be great to have uh, the great Greg Hill on our show tonight. But before we do that, do you have anything to share from the weekend? Anything happening since last time we talked? No, I had the gradu, so I have not been eating out. What is the gradu? Is that like a local it's an, slang? It's a nice way. Uh, another th- uh, the, the vavitz. The vavitz. That sounds Just a little Just how Yiddish. does it sound? Yeah. It, that's what it is. I don't want to say it. but So uh, I have not been eating uh, anything good or exciting huh. very bland so i have nothing nothing to report n- to report about food oh i'm sorry that sounds the, tragic in the past huh. five days yeah wow it's nothing it's not contagious okay no i didn't I mean think. that I just, <laughs> I just felt bad for you makes me a little sad yeah, when, when you sad. live in this town I, and you don't get to eat for a week that's yeah. like horrible have you uh had any great dining experiences lately? i, I have a bunch share? let's see today um my wife had jury duty and, you know, I work Tuesday to Sunday, so Monday's my only day off, so we usually spend Monday together. But I couldn't be with her because she was in jury duty all day. So, I, and, and I don't like to be productive on Monday. I take, like, a Sabbath. I'm like a second-day Presbyterian, you know? So what I do is I, um, you know, Seventh-day Adventist, like that, that, that doesn't make any sense. Okay, so anyway, so what I do is I, uh, I try, so I got to do something. I'm restless, so I decide to walk, and I just kept walking and walking and walking. So I walked to um, the quarter. And and then I called her to see if I could meet her for lunch. She still she wasn't even going to get. They didn't give her lunch break. In fact, they only had thirteen sandwiches. This is interesting. They had thirteen sandwiches. He thought he was going to have thirteen jurors by lunchtime, and they still had fifty people in the pool. So what did, what did the judge do? He had them cut the thirteen sandwiches into fifty pieces and then hand it around. My <laughs> wife got one sixth or something like that of a sandwich. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> right. Well, anyway, so um, on my way home, I just, uh, on a whim, I just went into Pesh, you know, the, um, the new um, Donald Link place. Yeah, I and, haven't been. Yeah, well, I didn't want to have a full-on meal. It felt a little wrong to do that by myself, you know? So I, there's something... Really? There's I a, love to eat by myself. No, I don't, I think it's wrong. It seems gluttonous. I mean, I love to eat like a pig, but I like to eat, I, I feel like I have to be with somebody when I do it, or it's, it's like, it's binging, you know what I mean? It's hmm. a feast if you're with somebody else. It's a binge if you're by yourself. Really? It's like oh, drinking gosh, alone. you're going to make me... R- ruin my whole this is that's what i do i'm not imposing before this on my you. husband this is goes my, out yeah, to hear music i you, you i out. go out by myself and eat on friday night come home relieve him all right and he will invite me along next time okay well anyway here's here's what happened. so i went to passion i got the seafood and the oyster soup and i got the grilled zucchini uh or not zucchini eggplant with garlic <laughs> And it was like $700, but it was really good. And, <laughs> and maybe I'll go back for a full meal after I, you know, in retirement or something when I can afford it. But, yeah, there was something on the lunch menu that was $66. But, um, yeah, but, uh, but I'm not saying it was overpriced, though. It was probably appropriately priced because it was really good. <laughs> but, um, anyway, that, that's, my, that's my, you don't want to hear about that anymore. Greg has much more interesting things yes, to say than this. So to, uh... let's get him on the air. How are you, Greg? Doing well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, I go to, I have five coffee shops within six blocks of my house, but I choose to go to Cafe Luna more than pretty much anywhere else because I enjoy it so much. I haven't always, but I really enjoyed it since you've been, you've been in charge since what, January you bought it? Yeah, we, uh, my wife and I took over January 15th. Um, I'd actually had my eye on the place for a while and the previous owner had offered it to me in 2008 for a really good price and it just wasn't. We should say where it is. It's on Nashville and Magazine. 802 and a half Nashville, right on the corner (laughs) of Nashville and Magazine. Um, Block from Whole Foods. And uh, like you were saying, Ray, there's, you know, 
half a dozen coffee shops within a you know three block radius really and um you know it's a tough market sort of cafe luna is the oldest uh it's been there longer than pj's longer than cc's really how long yeah. how long has it been 1992 there? was when cafe huh. luna got its name now, okay before that and you know there's all these guys that have been in the neighborhood their whole lives and uh, apparently it was an unnamed coffee shop run by a couple guys from tulane as like a project in their senior year in business school or something <laughs> they ran a coffee shop to see if you could years. make a, call, a go was, of a coffee shop without a, a name or a sign unnamed, or anything yeah. and if you'd ever been to cafe luna before and you've seen that sign on the outside of the building that just says coffee house yeah it's, it's down at the moment um came down in a windstorm at some point um uh, but i still have it in the closet um those guys hung that up i mean that was 1989 1990 and then a guy named john stennett named it cafe luna after his dog Luna, huh. um, and been there ever since. Um, and what was it before as a coffee shop? Because that, that building's old. That's an old Victorian is, building, huh? Uh, there's some rumors. Some people think they know what happened there before. but uh, until Like what the, are some of the rumors? Until the early 70s, for a fact, there were two retired school teachers living there. And um, there's a, a staple of the neighborhoods, a uh, gentleman by the name of Emmett. He, um, he gave me a story one time. That he was... At the mechanics across the street, which is, it was a service station, which is where the Pita Pit is now, which is what was previously Starbucks, um, and I'm sure it was a number of other things, but this was like 1969, he was, uh, he was at the service station, and, and a little old lady's like hollering across the street, I need help, I need help, and um, so him and another guy went over, and apparently the other school teacher that was, uh, you know, they were roommates, I suppose, um, she had fallen off the bed and she was stuck between the bed and the wall. So, you know, I'm sorry Ab to laugh. Ab no, I mean, it's a funny story. They're probably over it by now. It's yeah, been 44 sure. years. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, this was, a, this was in the early seventies and that's, um, you know, they, that's the last story of those school teachers that anybody can really recall. Um, and then there's another guy in the neighborhood that comes in and he insists that in 1974 he played a show. He's a uh, musician? A quote-unquote rock show uh -huh. at Cafe Luna. He huh. distinctly remembers the porch, and he remembers it being sort of a coffee shop. He's like, they had coffee, but nobody went in to buy coffee. <laughs> it was just like, they had it if you wanted it. But there It was, was like a, na a house was, with, yeah, they would yeah. invite like, neighbors the in? The stage was right there in front of the fireplace. He's like, the porch is the same. Everything in here is the same. I remember the fireplaces. The mirrors weren't here, but it was just like a house, and people were playing music. Huh. And uh, that was 1974, and then it may or may not have been a woodworking shop or a furniture restoration, you know, kind of some guys restoring old furniture. Um, and then the, the spot that is our kitchen now um, went through a number of, you know, different beauty salons slash hair salons. Something about that building just attracts. Yeah, because there's now, a there's a there's a hair, hair salon nails. next yeah, to you right now. Yeah. What's it called? It's Buffons. Buffons. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Is it uh, is that a hipster place and they're naming a Buffon or is it like for old people and it's really? Uh... Um, <laughs> I don't I don't know if it's if it's ironic at all. Um, it's run by two young girls. They look uh, kind of rockabilly. Two young girls. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They're you know they're they know. They got it going on style wise. Um, okay, so they're it, they're cool. It's not yeah, like yeah, seventy year old women really no, doing bouffant. And, and you know they do guys' okay. hair, girls' hair. Like okay. people are in and out all day long, and they come out looking great. So nice. Um, I don't know what else to say. I, mean, <laughs> okay. I, I guess yeah, people yeah. like going there, and they seem to do a great job. You know. So all right. I w have a question yeah. now. Um, how did the owner? offer you the place in 2008 did you work for him or did you in know him as a well he was a he was a i guess a customer of mine a client of mine i was doing um uh, repairing espresso machines uh, oh so okay i've basically been to every coffee shop in louisiana and mississippi to fix their broken equipment huh. um some places more than others some people know how to take care of their stuff some don't <laughs> um but, yeah, I went in there one time, and I guess he was just in a mood and was like, oh, I don't, I, I'm sick of running a coffee shop. You know, I mean, if you run your own business, I'm sure you have moments where you aren't sure it's that stressful. you want to do it much longer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
But uh, so yeah, you know. He put was, the bug in your ear in 2008. He said it then, like. Yeah. He yeah. made it. He's like, I'll give you a good deal on this place. He's like, I, you know. And I was like, yeah, I'll let you know. And then mm, five years later, eight, nine, 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 yeah, four and a half years later, four years later, I called him up. I was like, hey, you still want to sell? And he's like, oh, I just sold it last week. <gasps> signing the papers tomorrow. And I was like, ah, okay, well, good luck. Good talking to you. Um, and that was uh, between Christmas and New Year's and just this past December. So he called me back like the 4th of January. I was like, hey, that deal fell through. You still interested? I was like, well, yeah, you know, let me talk to my wife and see uh, what kind of money we can get together. Um, and uh, yeah, it was 15th, we were signing papers, so. Wow. Wait, he calls you on the 4th, by the 15th you, you own it. Yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah. man. Okay, so what happened fixing Expresso machines that you decided you wanted to go from that to owning a coffee shop, or was it just that location? You well, love that, love that, that location. location. I feel like was always, um, you know, and, and as, as with a lot of locations and a lot of coffee shops, I, from an insider as a guy that's been to every coffee shop, um, looking at them in a slightly different way than your average customer, I mm -hmm. suppose. Um, there's not a lot of people that do it right and take mm -hmm. full advantage of their location and, you know, um, you know, targeting exactly what, you know, that specific neighborhood may need or, you know, um, a lot of people just open a shop and impose their will upon the neighborhood okay. in a very fascist way. Um, <laughs> we're all a little fascist, so it's, you know, um, but, um, oh. You saw the potential in yeah, this yeah. It was location always, it was, particularly? I always thought it always, like, really needs a fresh coat of paint. Like, just little things. Like, just brighten the place up a little bit, you know. It always seemed to have, like, weird curtains that didn't let the light in. Just little things like that that, that you'll notice, um, you know. I get a list of grievances, Margo, I'm not going to say on the air, about the former way it was run. Yeah, yeah, and he did a he did a he did a fairly well job, fairly good job for a for a while. He had it since two thousand four, um, and the first couple of years um, he was really into it. He was excited, him and his wife, and then I guess Katrina had a lot to do with the fact that it was like uh, everything got kind of stressful, mm -hmm. and then um, you know who really knows, but yeah, it, it definitely went downhill um, a little bit. They dabbled in the restaurants kind of sort of things it was very confusing if you went in there over the past few years you weren't really sure if it was a restaurant or if it was a coffee shop everybody has memories of it being a coffee shop right. you know when they were in med school they were there all night every night um and then those if those same people that were there in the 90s came back last year they're like it was closed still at has like six the same name and it was closed <laughs> at two in the afternoon yeah right. you know on a saturday so huh. it was you know it, it was a weird situation. It's you know it's it was time for some new blood to get in there, and um, fortunately I was able to pull it off. So, right. well, looks like your plus one is here. And Margo, uh, actually, Greg had this idea that instead of introducing his plus one, we should first try to guess who his plus one is. We're each going to ask him questions. You want to still do that? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, uh, so why don't we each ask him a question? We'll, we'll do like yeah, five. Yeah, before, before he tells us. Before he tells about us, it. yeah, yeah, okay. see if we can get it. We each get a couple. Co oh, we okay, just do you one, go and one, first. one. Oh, you go okay. first. All right. Um, are you in the food business? Uh, no, just a big consumer. <laughs> okay. I I, ha I haven't played this game before. Let me think know. of a good question that. Uh, I I I I don't know. Gosh, I'm nervous. <laughs> Uh, we... Are you in a, a field that you have to talk to people face to face? Yes. All right. But that's yeah. Pretty much any field. Well, well I guess not. I know, not... like if you do something with computers, yeah, you don't true. talk that's to true. people face that's to face. True. I don't know. I was trying to get at sales or hmm. wait. Okay. Let's see. So it's, you... it's, it's in New I Orleans. I mean, that's not a very good question. Okay, that was just came off the top. Of I know, we should have rehearsed this before. This is actually a really good concept. I, I wish I had mentioned this to you. Yeah, okay. okay. 
So in New Orleans, right? Yes. Okay. That was fast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm screwing so you. So you talk to people, you live in this city, it's and not um, it's not food. Music. Um, are you yes. a... Yes. All right. You're, you're a musician. Yes. All right. Okay. Like, all right. All right. I, I give so up. So what kind We're of musician are you, and, and uh, why are you with this guy? Well, I've known this guy since 2003, 2002. And we played music together. I don't know. And he was working at a coffee shop at the time. Yeah. yeah. I think, what, what, where were you working at that point? Was it um, I was, Canal? I was managing City Perk, which, was, City Perk. Um, which is now the Bean Gallery. Um, on Car on was Carrollton? Formerly. Wait, wasn't City Perk on Friends? Was no, that called City that Perk? That was Central Perk. Oh, Central, um, Perk. Yeah. Central Perk. No, no, City, City Perk was the, the oh. first PJs franchise in New Orleans um, oh. uh, from 1991. And you mean Phyllis Jordan's? Yeah, yeah. It was first the rest, first coffee first shop. franchise. First yeah. franchise in, in the city. Okay. Um, every, the, originally, like the magazine shop and Maple Street were company owned. I hate to interrupt yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. But you didn't tell us your name. Hi, I'm John Thompson, and I'm the John. special guest plus one. <laughs> <laughs> John Thompson is my plus one. I mean, okay. you're about to tell us what what John does. Is that what you're doing? Yeah, I can go ahead and do that. I guess yeah. you know we've we've dragged the well, suspense on long yeah. enough. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay, um, I've played music for years, and, and I've played with him for a long time. But in 2006, I started a record label ah. called Total Riot Records. Plug, plug, plug. <laughs> yeah. um, and plug it more. Tell us about it. Yeah. Why, and why? So we just, we've done a lot, of, a lot of CD. We've probably got 20 albums that we've released over the years. Um, a lot of the bands have broken up at this point. But uh, right now on our current roster is Strange Rue. Which is a blues, rock and roll, New Orleans, female fronted kinda. Um, yeah. And then there's the Dapper Dandies, which is old traditional jazz tunes. And um, White Collar Crimes, which you were in White Collar Crimes for a little while, right, Greg? Yes, I was a, uh, I was, I was a, dr I was a drummer for a, a short bit. <laughs> I was basically the understudy, you know. So and there on the label, it's a uh, live hip hop. You know, it's not it's not hip hop with a beat. It's hip hop with a band and, and horns. And um, we actually just did Andre Fest last night, which I don't know if you heard about that, but that's a whole other food thing. Yeah, all, yeah all that's something you, uh, you should talk to Dan Stein about. Steins. Oh. Anyway, um, yeah, yeah. Well, we so we've got uh, we've got those guys on the label, and we've we've done put out a lot of CDs. Um, I ran a recording studio for about four years called Rhodes Recording Studio, which is now defunct, but I'm just running the label now and uh, mixing a little bit out of my house and stuff like that. Um, but the way I guess I fit into this whole thing is I'm a musician, but Greg and I have always sort of had this like coffee. Well, I, he's always had the coffee. <laughs> I, he's just always given me coffee. <laughs> and I've just like always been interested in his coffee. When you were a starving musician, right. too, he would... So he worked at City Park first, and I would be like, hey, give me some free coffee, man. I'm coming coffee. Yeah, of course. <laughs> oh. and, then, and then after that, I guess it was Coffee Roasters, where yeah. he learned to be a bean connoisseur. So that's what I'm telling you. Like, this guy, <laughs> you go to his coffee shop, and you know he's going to have, at least I hope, because as much as he knows about it, he <laughs> should have some quality beans there, because he... He roasted beans and he fixed espresso machines for what five, six years. Yeah, from two thousand three until uh, two thousand eight or nine, so, and then and then off and on. I was I, I did some freelance for them after after I officially left the company. I, I did a lot of service work. He's done everything with coffee except like grow it. I think. Yeah. <laughs> have you thought about growing it? Can you I grow have, it in Louisiana? No, you can't. Coffee grows. Well, coffee produces better between the tropics so we're outside of the your your typical coffee growing region um you won't get a lot of fruit you just won't get a lot of yield and we don't really have the altitude here right. coffee better coffee grows high altitudes okay you know, above sea level at yeah least. we're pretty low yeah yeah, yeah a little bit <laughs> monkey hill you could grow it on monkey <laughs> yes, hill yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, then actually you know what the i read the most expensive is this is true the most expensive coffee in the world is the kind of bean that they feed to elephants the elephants I'm, eat it, crap it out. They pick it out of the elephant's poo, yeah. and then they wash it off and grind it. The and so, the yeah, so we got the elephants. The we got yeah. the elephants in the zoo, and that's the highest point in New Orleans. Yeah. So that could be. And it's pretty hot there. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be getting conversation with you. Yeah. I'd like a cut for it if it oh, works out. The, the best coffee grows where your climate is pretty consistent throughout the year, which oh. you need like that, that moderate altitude near the equator because um, you're right. not going to really ever get a winter. Um, you know, you're going to get a fair amount of rain and a, a good amount of heat, but at the higher altitude, it's not going to be as hot. Okay. So the yeah, ideal growing conditions. And then, you know, the volcanic areas tend to help with the, you know, the the soil tends to produce better coffee. Uh, so like Hawaiian coffee has got, you know, some, some flavor that is very desirable. Same with Jamaican. They got their little volcano there, I guess. And So Greg, list all the different uh, ways that you've been involved with coffee professionally. So you, you've, uh, you said you fixed espresso machines for a living. You um, ran a coffee shop. You've owned a coffee shop. Uh, what else have you done with coffee? You ro worked for a roasting? Yes, uh, for Orleans Coffee Exchange. Um, not, uh, they were originally in the French Quarter on Orleans Avenue, and then they uh, they closed their retail shop and went to just a wholesale a wholesale roaster. Um, and I was I apprenticed for six months, and then I roasted for a year after that. Um, um, you know, in the heat, <laughs> in the middle of the summer. It's it's a fun job. Um, so what do you do? Like, what does that look like? Roasting coffee. Yes, yeah. it's, it's loud. Um, like you're feeding beans into a machine? Like what yeah, does that mean? Yeah. Okay, okay. Unroasted coffee, which is, uh, you know, it's the seed of a coffee cherry. I mean, coffee's not really a bean. We just call them beans because it's, they look like beans. I really don't know why people don't call them seeds because that's really what they are. Um, huh. But it's a seed of a, of a cherry that grows on the coffee plant. Um, anyway, they're, they're processed several different ways at origin typically, which is where they're, where they're grown. And then they're bagged and you know brokered by companies and individuals and you know uh shipped to wholesalers or roasters and then um they're roasted bagged and shipped to retail shops so they're roasted in the french quarter where you worked is that what it was um they were originally roasting there and then they moved the facility to julia street um and then they finally got a facility on rendon um which they had until katrina that can't really do much with seven feet of water um and then they bought out who was probably their largest competitor in town at the time, which was um, uh, New Orleans Coffee Works, which was a, um, uh, I guess, a spinoff of Covington Coffee Works, which is a uh, part of the same ownership group that uh, Cafe Rainey was involved with. Huh. It's part of that whole family of businesses. Um, so they were bought out by Orleans Coffee Exchange in 2006. Uh, or in 2005, and then when they bought began the purchase process and moved into the facility um so yeah i mean eight years in you know wholesaling you know uh i got to see a lot um so and not to was, mention his boss was our drummer yes okay i and thought you were a drummer Yes. Well, You're, you were you an know apprentice drummer? You know how it, is, how it is in this town. Everybody, <laughs> Everybody's I, a drummer? I was the understudy <laughs> drummer for White Collar Crimes, um, which meant I was, when they needed a drummer for the show, I was, I knew I knew the set, I could show up and play. Um, you know, and I like to hang out with the Donald Trumpets. They're pretty fun. <laughs> Donald Trumpets. So wait, what instrument that, oh, that, did that's you the, play? That's did the you tell us and I didn't, um... uh, Guitar mainly, but okay. like Greg was saying, you know, we all can play multiple instruments so y'all had similar paths though because you you started out in music and now then you turned it you own a business like you own a business right so you went into business you learned a similar i mean you followed a similar path with coffee you worked in it and then you decided to have your own business do y'all um your conversations today are probably a little different than band days you know, but has does owning businesses uh, change the joy for either of y'all, or enhance it, or um, more stress, or? I would say just I I not really owning the business probably doesn't make it makes me enjoy it more. But I don't really like music anymore, like like like, <laughs> like, like the way I used to when it was new and fun and mysterious. And how do they do that? And how does it sound so good? And then you. It's like a magician who, the magician isn't like mesmerized by his tricks. He's like, yeah. So you see how the sausage is made. Right. Yeah, so you don't want to, you don't right. like it anymore. Yeah. yeah. Real, real, so, wait, so. I mean, so I, being, I like it. I like it, but it's. Being like a music producer, I guess you call yourself, or what, what do we call, yeah. Basically, has ruined you to music, kind of? 
I wouldn't say ruined it, but just sort of. That's horrible. That's a tragedy. How old are you? You're like 30? Yeah. So for the next 40 <laughs> years, you're just not going to enjoy music the way you used to? No, I mean, it's been that way for 10 years, probably. <laughs> so for like 50 years of your life, you're not going to enjoy music? Uh, do you well, play I'm gonna anymore? Enjoy, I'm going to enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm still going to enjoy it, but there's. There's uh, It's I'm, the saddest guest we've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what you're, I, I know you. <laughs> when you begin to have to worry about <laughs> the whole business that. side of everything, it kind of it doesn't leave much room for for all the fun stuff. Which is, it was originally just all fun stuff, and it's like, oh, now. Are you going to tell us you hate coffee now too? No, no, no I love coffee. Oh, good, Trust good, me. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but I mean, he's only <laughs> been do, he's been doing it less than a year. No, he's but he's been doing it ten years. No, no, but he's been doing it. We're going to have you back in ten years. Or something, right? He's yeah, but yeah, owning yeah. a business. That was my question. Oh, the owning is what ruined business. it. So if you still were just playing not, and not, not owning, no, 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 not it. owning. It's not maybe. necessarily owning that ruined it for me. It's just it's just being exposed to it so much. You get desensitized to music. The, huh. the magic sort of starts to fade. You know it's what if not, you ate? Okay, what if what's your favorite what's your favorite meal? What's your oh, favorite? I don't know. I can't answer that. What's one that you oysters? At least love? I don't know. Oysters. Okay, you yeah. love oysters. What if yeah. you had to have oysters for every meal? Yeah, oysters could gross you out eventually. Yeah. You know what happened? It would be one bad oyster would do it for me eventually. Yeah. If I ever have a really really bad oyster, there's a ruin. lot of bad bands yeah, out yeah. there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, and people don't just yeah, but like I've heard say bad bands before. It you can't make just me throw like, them oh, in okay, the trash. Now I hate yeah, music. but you don't have to deal with them every day. I mean. Yeah, like, you, did you are do you feel the same passion going into work to today? I mean, I'm not saying it's the same thing, but yeah, maybe. aren't there huh. some things that were so exciting yeah, when you that's were true. young? Um, that's true. Yeah. Uh, you don't even know what to call me. Yeah, I don't <laughs> know. What would you? What, 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 what? <laughs> yeah. If I, you're I not a you. rabbi, what do I what do I know? Yeah. <laughs> and I don't, yeah, right. Okay, I can see that. Yeah, I can see. What is it called when you first start? I'm a started? minister. Yeah. When you first start out, though, weren't you like. Seminarian or something? What do you want to. I don't know. What are you getting it, at? N- nothing. <laughs> like, weren't you like super excited and now maybe you, you have days where you're a little bitter and it, it's not so much fun to hear everybody's yeah. problem? Or, okay, I get it. I don't know. Yeah, but I wouldn't say like it's ruined me to church or whatever like that. Like, like he's this poor guy's been <laughs> ruined not, to music. No, you're well, saying that he wasn't. Well, saying to that. keep it interesting, it's it's kind of like you, you get bored with the with the same old thing, you know, uh-huh. and then you you want to move on to something new, or you want to, you know, let's say like the first time I heard of Chuck Berry when I was ten, I was like, whoa, what is that guy doing? And now it's like, uh, don't, 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 you know, everybody <laughs> wants to play Chuck Berry or a guitar solo or the blues or rock and roll or whatever. Right. So yeah, blah blah blah. What else? What can I do? How do I record this? How do I make some new kind of music? How do I? Okay. You know, like what? What's new? It, you know, the, I'm bored in the bedroom, and I want let's like you know let's let's pull out some, some new <laughs> oh, toys. <we're> gonna... <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, interesting. Nice analogy. I don't know if this is that kind of this is. It is. So this is, bring it on. Come so, on, so let's make is, uh, Ray sweat. Yeah. Well. Okay. So this is so this is why musicians all do a lot of drugs, right? Because you gotta you got you got you gotta be able to keep it interesting. Maybe so. Well, I, yeah. have, I have theories on that, but you know. Well, let's hear what. What? Um, in my experience, and a lot of people I know, um, I always got such a rush from playing, and you really like that high will never go away unless you you have to balance it out with something else. It's usually a lot of alcohol. Being on stage is an adrenaline rush. If you're really enjoying what you're doing and, you know, people, like the energy, it's crazy. And that doesn't just fade away quickly when the show is over. You're going to be up all night regardless of whatever drugs you do. And eventually, I guess that, that rush will wear off. But you're a rock star, so you have to stay up all night. So then what happens? Then you start turning to things that are going to help you keep that lifestyle going that you can't, uh. that you can no longer get naturally. Um, so, I mean, I've seen that happen with a lot of a lot of friends of mine that originally were just like, yeah, let's go play a show. It's awesome. And then we were just like, you know, drink beers all night, be fine, go to sleep, normal, back to practice the next day. And then, you know, you just do it over and over and over and over. And it's just uh. like... Just like any other drug. I mean, music yeah. can really be a drug, and, like, that adrenaline huh. rush you get. Well, you know, we've heard that from some restaurant people, too, that, like, you know, after they're done, you think they'd be exhausted. They, they work late, and then they go out afterwards. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because, you know, it's a creative endeavor, maybe. It gets your adrenaline going, and you don't know how to come down from that, so you just keep it going. Yeah. yeah. And to keep up a pace like that, I mean, huh. that can isn't that 
hard to maintain. Let's say you're playing gigs several nights a week. I mean, that, that or staying up late working in a restaurant. Right. You kind of need help moving forward. I don't know. Yeah. Eventually. And I mean, you know, I mean, you got a lot of these guys working in kitchens. They're working like 16, 18, 20 hour shifts. I mean, right. you know, um, you know, same thing if you're in a band, like you, you're going to meet the band in the afternoon, like 12, one o'clock, maybe run through some stuff. Then you're going to go have some food and go back. You're going to load up. You're going to, you know, go to the venue, drop your stuff off. You're going to hang out. You may do a sound check. And that's like, before you even play a show, you've been, you know, oh. working. I just did air quotes, working for <laughs> six or eight hours before you're even on stage. Um, you know, if you're if you're pro, I mean, I've been in some bands where we're just like winging it. Where you know we show up and it's like I forgot my guitar, dude. Yeah. Anybody got a guitar I can borrow? Uh, I think that was the band that I was in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now why now why don't you you haven't had music in your in uh, at Luna yet, have you? Since you since you've opened, have you thought about it? You must we, have thought uh, about it. We have had some music. Oh, okay. It's just not something that uh, zoning allows. It, it they just get you in trouble. We don't have a permit. I'll just say that. Oh. Um, but we do. We have um, an artist of the month that every month we we get fresh art on the walls. So um, for two openings, and whoever the artist is, like we don't, you know, if you have some stuff, you need a venue, we'll take your art, as long as it's not like crazy or weird, too weird. I mean, it's art, so it can be weird. But I've got somebody um, for you. By the way, it is a family <laughs> establishment, you know, so. Um, we do have a back room and walls that are higher up. So if you have stuff that's like that, that's fine. Um, but you have an opening. And, you know, two artists have had some friends that have come in and played. Um, Dana Abbott played for March. Um, Tamar Khan's opening. It was like March 7th or something. Um, Dana Abbott from Dana Abbott Band. So she played a little acoustic set. That was fun. Um, and then another artist had a, a friend of his come by and play some music, and it was cool. I mean, there's yeah. an apartment upstairs, and I just let them know, and it's, you know, <laughs> not like we're having any amplification, and it's, you know, we're open for business during that time. And Yeah, so you're not their landlord, the people upstairs, right? No, so, no. Yeah, that's, got a, that's not a conflict, though. No, 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 I mean, they're cool. They're really cool. They're used to it. <laughs> Neighbors are cool, yeah. Yeah, that's great. So, we um, get each other's mail all the time. I just think it's kind of so. neat that you're... Okay, so you've been to every coffee shop, basically, in the city, right? Mm -hmm. You know all the... all the, all the the uh, Just every neighborhood and all the rest of that. I got and then dirt. you uh, have <laughs> an eye, though, for this spot on Nashville and Magazine. When it's sandwiched between... I mean, you have Velvet two blocks over from you. And then you have PJ's and CC's about three blocks over from you, mm -hmm. four blocks over here. Laurel Street Bakery's only about five or six blocks mm -hmm. from you. Yeah. And... Um, who else do you have? You have, well, of course, you got a coffee shop in Whole Foods right there a block or two from you. Mm -hmm. um, you have all the, and, but yet, you're not afraid to go into business yourself, take all that risk, and do all that right in the middle of everything. Why is that? I mean, what is it about that spot that made you say this is something that's doable even with all the competition? Um, I'm probably a little nuts. <laughs> um, <laughs> you have to be, though. Most guys would say, oh, that's crazy. There's too much competition. That place doesn't have enough business. What are you going to do to, like compete what are you gonna do to compete with cc's right. i don't want to compete with cc's right you're totally I don't wanna different i don't want to compete with velvet right. i don't want to compete with little i mean all those guys they have their thing they have you know they're you know they're reaching the target now laurel street on the other hand because we're we're baking everything in-house at luna right um they're the only other person velvet does some baking some light baking they do some scones and you know yeah. they have some pop tarts good, good pop tarts that they that they make in-house um you know, Dee's bakes their own stuff. Yeah, they're all the way in the CBD. That's you know, they're, they're yeah, so, that's not really so competition. Okay, um, yeah, so but, far away. But here's the thing: there are enough places that are doing that and doing it well enough that people are starting to recognize that there is a difference between you know the mass-produced croissants that everybody gets delivered every single morning to every other coffee shop in town, um, and the guys that do all their own stuff. I mean, you can walk in and look at a pastry case in any shop and tell where they got their croissants because most of them look exactly the same like you know 90 percent of the coffee shops in this town have identical almond croissants <laughs> they have the same blueberry muffins they have the same cranberry orange scones and it's fine they sell people like them but there aren't 
really enough options. So people are like, well, I'm going to get coffee and I guess I'll have a muffin. You know, um, it's like it's some weird business model and yeah. baking muffins isn't hard. Doing it from scratch is like a little ambitious if you're a coffee shop and don't have a kitchen big enough. Um, we're pretty fortunate that we do have a big enough kitchen to do all of that. Um, you know, I, I go through 100 pounds of flour every two weeks. It's crazy. Tons of 100 flour. pounds of flour every two weeks. Yeah, yeah. That's not blueberry muffin mix. That's flour. Oh, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> flour. I mean, we use right. for our for our handmade croissants, 100 percent handmade, um, you know, hand kneaded. No like mixer with a, you know, everything by hand. Um, yes, yeah, so we have four different kinds of flour that we make all our different pastries with all fresh fruit. If it's out of season, we're going to do our best to not have it. Wait, so when I get when I get the strawberry uh, like croissant at your place or whatever? Yeah, you're not gonna have strawberry anything in September. Yeah, okay. Or in August. I'm Just, saying you actually like crush fruit, huh? Oh yeah, yeah. It's not like jelly or whatever. No, that's like no. that's amazing. Wow. If it's something jelly like, like right now we're doing a uh, uh, blackberry mascarpone croissant. That's actually fresh oh, blackberries that like. That sounds we, divine. We puree, you know. So it, there's still some seeds in there which aren't really desirable if you talk to some higher ups in the culinary world if you have seeds in your fruit you're not doing it right it's not <laughs> polished or refined but uh, we like a little bit of rusticness if yeah. that's a word and Rust- you are texture, are you yeah. baking Rusticity? yourself or are you yeah yeah he well did, i go in there sometimes i'm talking to him he disappears and there's no croissants and i'm kind of relieved because i'm because i eat too much right <laughs> so i'm kind of relieved there's no because i can't say no to those croissants and then and then he comes back out you know, a few minutes later, I'm talking to him, and I look down, and there's like 30 croissants. I'm like, oh, crap, I'm going to eat 10 of those. <laughs> so is that something else? That, are you self-taught, or did you? Uh... Yeah, apparently I'm, I'm, I'm a professional baker now, which <laughs> I, wasn't really my intention. Um, that started in January? Well, no. My wife, who is uh, you know, also my business partner, she's uh, 32 weeks pregnant at the moment. So wow. we're, having, we're having our second kid in July. Um, uh, she was doing the baking and it was kind of something that just sort of happened. We just started baking our own stuff. Um, it's basically one day a pastry order didn't get called in, so we weren't going to get our delivery. Um, so we were like kind of scrambling and it's like, oh, let's just make some muffins. So we made some muffins and they were really good. And then, you know, just took off from there. And then we got really ambitious and decided to do our own croissants, which is, huh. If you do it right, it's a two-day process. Is that more cost-effective for you too? I mean, uh, than getting them from the supplier. <laughs> Since I don't really pay myself, but I'm not <laughs> right. paying somebody by the hour to do it. Um, it is. It's, it's got to be money. cheaper to make your own croissant yeah, than to get raw, a croissant. The raw ingredients. So not are, only is it better but and the fresher. The time it takes you to do it. I mean, that that's got to be. It's pretty time. And it saves on cigarettes too, right? Because you're smoking less while you're working in the kitchen. Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And I'll tell you, like you know, like you got to give it to some bakers. Those rolling pins. It, it's hard work. You know, work like, out, I have yeah. some muscles. Like I didn't, uh, I didn't know my obliques went this high. Like, <laughs> you, you know, you roll out some dough for two or three hours a day for a week, and you're like, wow, I have muscles here that I didn't know about. <laughs> They're literally on the outside of my ribs, like halfway to my armpits. I'm like, huh. that's just bone. I didn't know there was, there was muscle there. <laughs> but yeah, so my wife, uh, my wife was doing it all, and then um, you know she started having like that, you know. She's 32 weeks pregnant, so it's like, I can't really be on her feet that long. So she gave me a crash course. Now, her stuff was awesome. So she, in one afternoon, she's like, I had helped her. I was like her little sous chef, baker, <laughs> helper, dishwasher, really. Um, so we spent an afternoon together, like, making the muffins and everything. And, you know, it's not really that hard. Like, I don't know why more people don't do it. The croissants, on the other hand, I don't really recommend doing it unless you're just going to be so stubborn and insist on making everything by hand. It's a lot more so work. That's you. It's a lot more work. Yeah, no, I, I've, I've, I'm a firm believer in making it by hand if you're mm. willing to put in the time and energy because it's you're, it's better finished product. Yeah. Um, you can definitely tell the difference. You know, yeah. yeah, I mean, we also we don't have a freezer and we don't have a microwave. No freezer, no microwave. Everything's made from scratch by hand. Wow. Just not people don't do that. Nobody doesn't have a microwave. There isn't a single other coffee shop in this town that doesn't have a microwave. We don't have a microwave. Everybody's got a freezer. We don't have a freezer. What do I need to freeze? Just go buy fresh fruit, make muffins. That's it. That's all there is to it. Everybody in, seems to insist on, like, 
I don't know. Maybe they're afraid of running out of stuff. They need to keep their freezers full. Oh. Kind of silly to me. There's no reason you shouldn't have fresh stuff. All day, well, I'm day. glad to hear that you are uh, doing well and doing it from scratch and excited about it because th that, that really is wonderful. I mean, it's how things used to be done. So it's, and yeah. uh, so you're bringing it back. Yeah, we're trying. And well, it's kind of how you connected to your product too. I mean, you like you, you're you're so into the beans and you're into that long before you ever did this, and then now yeah. you're, you're getting that way with the bakery stuff too, where it's yeah. like you're you're involved and in start to finish all of it. And that's yeah. kind of really neat. Yeah, yeah. So you're not. I mean, eventually yeah. I'll hire a manager and I can you know go home and take a nap every now and then, but and know. have a little <laughs> bit of a life. Yeah, yeah, you. a little bit. Yeah, maybe get the band back together or something like that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Again, since I have, I have a two and a half year old and I haven't played a show out since he's been born, so. Um, two and a half years before I've, since I've been on a stage. I miss it a little bit, but, you know, I have a lot to keep me keep So, me I mean, when you were on stage happy. continually, what, from, like, high school age or, like, how? I got my first guitar my freshman year of high school, and, you know, I learned a bunch of riffs. You when know? did you start playing, like, when did you start performing, like, for money? I think tips, I, at least, or whatever. No, I, I don't think I've ever really made any money playing. <laughs> Does anybody really make money playing? I think... Is I that why really you went into the business? Because you weren't... Making um, any money? Well, just because I got bored. Like okay. I said, I just, like, mm. Never really played for the money. Anyway. Well, yeah. You know, you play in a band, and it's like, okay, well, you think you're going to go get a show, and, like, everything's going to be great. You know, oh, there'll be 100 people there. No, there's something called promotion. Well, then I'll learn about that. Well, how do I promote? Well, you have to have a recording. Well, what is that? And so I just, like... Instead of, we were DIY back mm -hmm. in the day, so ah. instead of like hiring and outsourcing, we just learned to do it ourselves, and eventually, it's like, well, I know all these people with all these different sets of skills, and I have this set, these sets of skills, and we just start a business, mm -hmm. you know? Okay, well, nothing to do with any of what we're talking about, but maybe mm -hmm. we'll find out some deep, dark secret from this part of the show. We would like you to each pick a number between 1 and 217, and you have to answer the question from the book of questions. Okay. So let's... You can lie, but you have to answer. There's no pleading the fifth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Make something up if you don't want to. Okay. What is your favorite number? 13. Okay. What would constitute a perfect evening for you? Oh. <laughs> is, that, is that a terrible question? Well, it, it, if, I, if I've ever had a perfect evening, it's, it's probably already happened a long time ago. Well, if and you could it, relive it, what would it, what would it be? Um, like eating a bunch of food and maybe like drinking a bunch of alcohol. With anybody in particular, or it doesn't matter. Just like yeah, as Just long as, as there's long a lot of people do. around that are mm -hmm. gonna say funny stuff. You okay. Know. So be entertained and yeah. All right. Okay. That's achievable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really. That sounds yeah. It sounds about like <laughs> it, it does more or less. three or four nights a week for me. Yeah. Okay. I will do one one hundred eleven. That's a new one. You want to ask it, or you want me to ask? Either way. Okay. If your parents became, I think we've already asked this one, but if your parents became infirm and the only alternative to bringing them into your home was to put them in a nursing home, would you do so? What about a sister or brother who suffered a permanently crippling injury other than your home had nowhere to go but a convalescent home? They're going to the home. <laughs> <laughs> Are they listening right now? Yeah, I, I've already discussed it with every single person in my family. Yeah. You They're thought about this? This oh, yeah, is not yeah. a... Yeah, uh... yeah you, guys, you guys are going to a home. They're saving for it now. <laughs> <laughs> Special accounts. Wow. So Does your family they're... live here? No, in... my parents live, uh, live in D.C. All right. They left here. Uh, actually, fortunately, they left just, just before Katrina. Oh. So they um, moved? They lived in New Orleans before that yeah. and moved? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you pretty much grew up here, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. In Algiers. Yeah. Yep. Same same neighborhood you're in now. Are you in the Point Two, or? No, uh, we're in uh, Old Aurora, which is a uh, you know mid century. Okay. Mid twentieth century. Um, <laughs> neighborhood, you know, everything's nice. built in the fifties and sixties. All right. When like electric houses were like all the rage, 
<laughs> are there efficiency. any houses still uh, left that are cool like that, mid-century modern, or Ours are they all being redone? has a really nice profile. Um, it's uh, this about five or six other houses on my block that are the same layout. Um, some are mirror image. But uh, it's a great neighborhood. I mean, it's great for families. I turned you, out just fine over there. You know, I'm, I had so I'm, a I'm two over blocks there. from the house I grew up in. So. You're two blocks in the house you grew up in. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You, it used to take like 45 minutes to get there from here, and it was beautiful. I yeah. mean, it was like a nice drive. Now it's like you know, you zip. You're, you're not far away. Yeah. yeah. But, right. And did you grow up here? I actually grew up in Buras, Louisiana, which is. If Louisiana looks like a boot and there's a little toe at the end, <laughs> I'm from the toe. The Calabria of, uh, of, of, of Louisiana. What is that? Calabria is the, the, the toe at the end of the Italian boot. The, the, whenever else thinks okay. of a boot, geographically, they think of Italy except here. And here it's like that sock. That's the, yeah. That sounded dirty. Calabria, no? <laughs> yeah. Calabria it sounds sound dirty? dirty? Yeah. It sounds, it like sounds like a ver- venereal disease or something. Like <laughs> yeah, it does. Or like you're like a body part. Or no, something. it's a very nice part of Italy where people <laughs> oh, make good pasta. Oh, it's a place in Italy. I thought yeah. it was, it's a part of the toe. It's the toe on the boot oh, toe in Italy. Italy. I thought you meant of the foot, like you were making a reference to oh, like, like feet, right. like, like phalanges so, like, or something. Yes, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, uh, okay. Metatarsal I or, um, yeah, sorry. I'm not big on my <laughs> Italian geography. So yeah, I, we just I guess, we just yeah. call it, it's just down the road, you know. Where I came from, you everybody say down knows the road. All. You know yeah. exactly where you're talking about. <laughs> Is that like Cajun or like not down the bayou? It's just no, down it's the not road. Cajun. It is more. Uh, there's um, natives, which they're call they call them mulattas, but which is, is like what? So it's oh, a, yet, a, a yet pronunciation of mulatto. Oh. But, there, but uh, technically, if you look in the dictionary, mulatto is half black and half white. Right. These people are like natives mixed with like French and Spanish. Um, you know, so there's like that kind of culture mixed with like, you know, just European immigrants, um, like German, French, Spanish, Irish, you know, Creole yet culture. Uh, not a lot of like the Acadian French. I mean, I think that's all like Lafayette and yeah. Western. Yeah. Um, a lot of seafood, shrimp, oysters, crabs. Good What's stuff. the music? What influenced you musically when you were growing up? I mean, that. Uh, well, you're you're young. May, I don't know. Maybe the internet was big when you were. But did a you bit. have? No, it hadn't been invented. No? Yet. Okay. Originally, it was. Uh, <laughs> Originally, it was um, Michael J. Fox as Marty McFly, and then I realized that <laughs> it, what it, what I actually liked was Chuck Berry, because because Marty McFly back to didn't. Chuck Berry again, yeah. Some Back to the Future is that what you're talking about? The right. movie, right? Do you remember the guitar part? Yeah, mm. and I thought that song was written about me because my name's John, and as an eight year old kid, you know, way down in Louisiana, close to New Orleans, back oh. in the middle of Monday, Evergreens. Yeah. yeah, I'm like, oh, that song's about me, so I should buy a guitar because obviously. <laughs> The whole world the is knows like, about you. The whole world is centered around me. Just ask my parents. You know? <laughs> Your hair's kind of like Michael J. Fox too, you know. Thank you. And you have a sweet look. I'm just waiting on a, Goldie like Wilson a... to walk by. And <laughs> Maya, Goldie Wilson, I like this. I'm gonna clean up this town. <laughs> Good. You can start well, by sweeping place, the floor. This place kind of looks like Lou's. Or it does. Whatever. It yeah. does. Yeah. <laughs> if you can't, yeah. They, I mean, right. everyone at home they can't see this place, but it's got the. They've all been here. Yeah. yeah, they've yeah. all been here. Everybody's yeah. been here, <laughs> at least once. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, so so we have like three minutes left. So Greg, I didn't ask you yet. Okay, so you've been at you know, you've been at every coffee shop pretty much in New Orleans, close to it. Unless First, it's opened in the last year. Okay, okay. Yeah. So let me ask you a few things. How, about how many are there roughly? Um, I would say between five and six hundred, if you count all of the five and six hundred, and you've been and Mississippi, and you think, yeah. oh, and oh, the whole state of Louisiana, and Mississippi, and Mississippi, not just New Orleans. Yeah. And New Orleans has New Orleans has has more than half of those. Wow. Yeah, I want to I mean, know. You know. There's like twenty or thirty in Jackson, and then surround, every little college has like five coffee shops. But New Orleans probably has two hundred and fifty. You think? Oh, at least. Okay, Maybe I have two yeah. speed questions because yeah, we have. Go. Was the coffee shop invented in New Orleans? And what do you think of chicory? No, the coffee shop was invented. It's actually Lloyd's of London was the original coffee shop <laughs> that was, um, um, well, maybe not the original coffee shop, but the m- first modern day. You used to go and drink coffee like in, in Turkey and in right. Egypt and all that. They had all that going on for a very long time. Lloyd's of London started as a coffee shop. Um, so it was really like a, 
a European thing, um, you know, British thing. It was really refined as like a place to go and like purchase something of, you know, whatever and hang out and, uh, you know, discuss things, life and business and, Hmm. you know, insurance apparently. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But the original coffee shop, I believe, was in um, uh, one of the oldest that's still in operation is in Vienna, I believe, Austria. Right. Um, You can still go there today. But, I mean, there were coffee coffee. shops in New Orleans long before the rest of the country had a lot of coffee shops. Yeah, coffee came, this was a big port, like New Orleans and San Francisco. Everything from Indonesia and India all comes in San Francisco. Everything from Africa, South America comes in in New Orleans. Okay, you have a favorite coffee shop besides Luna. Um, How about just for the coffee? Just forget about the atmosphere, because we know coffee shops are about atmosphere as much as the coffee. But how about just for the coffee? Ouch, ouch. Um... Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a good one. I'll probably have to say Zots. Honestly. Really? Okay. I, I like Zots a lot. Yeah. Okay. And then how about for like the whole package, like for the coffee, including the atmosphere? Um, full package? It's hard to tell. Uh, that's why I got my own shop because I don't think anybody really has the full Zots package. has got a kind of a cool uh, atmosphere yeah. too. Yeah. It has um, this naked Barbie doll pictures up on the wall and all yeah. that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, I think we're out of time, aren't we? We didn't get to chicory though. Do you oh, think yeah, chicory. chicory sucks ass, or do you like chicory? <laughs> I'm not a fan. I understand why the rest of the world wants to try it, because right. it's, like, sort of legendary. I, I mean, There's no point in it, really, anymore. Like, it was, med- it was a cheap medicinal filler, right? Prop- medicinal properties in France hundreds of years ago, and they got used to drinking it, and they added it to their coffee, and then mm. they decided to bring it back in the Civil War because it was cheaper. Extended but, it. I, I think it tastes like garbage. Okay. You can get your vitamins elsewhere. Great. All right. Well, unfortunately, we are running out of time. So, this was great. Well, thanks, thanks, y'all. Yeah. Well, our special guest tonight at Midnight Menu Plus One was Greg Hill and John Thompson. You can find out about Greg's Cafe Luna and also about John's um, Total Riot Records, right? TotalRiotRecords.com. Okay. The, the uh, we'll have links for those places on our website. Anything else you want to say, plug wise? You're at eight oh two and a half Nashville. Is that what it is? Eight oh two and a half Nashville. All right. Save the ferries. <laughs> Save the ferries, definitely. You know the ones oh, we talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The other ferries are long extinct. They don't. <laughs> well, we'll find links to that on itsneworleans.com, and that's also where you can find links for our show. Our show is recorded live at Ted's Frost Top on Claiborne Avenue in Calhoun in Uptown New Orleans. Ted's is open seven days a week serving first-class burgers, beer, and their awesome homemade root beer in a frosty mug. I think this is, a, Mark, this is our first episode where we didn't talk about the root beer in the midst of the show, I think. Well, Midnight Menu Plus One is produced by Grant Morris, and Brian Ruiz is our technical director. I like to say his name Ruiz. Um, uh, why don't you go to itsneworleans.com and learn more about Midnight Menu there. And while you're there, you can follow us on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook. You can sign up for our mailing list. I mean it. And while you're at itsneworleans.com, you can listen to other episodes of Midnight Menu Plus One. Uh, also, Happy Hour, Mindset, True to the Game, Win Win, Out to Lunch, all the things you've been dying to listen to. You can hear it all there. If you're listening to the show on iTunes, thank you for subscribing. Maybe you could take a minute to rate and review us, and that helps other people find us. Minute Menu Plus One is a production of INO Broadcasting for itsneworleans.com. Until we meet again here at Ted's Frost Top, I'm Ray Kanata. And I'm Margo Moss. Good night. You know Labor Day signals the unofficial end of summer, but not the end of your outdoor projects. Lowe's helps you do it right and helps you save with Labor Day deals throughout the store. Shop now and get two bags of Stay Green Potty Mix for $12. And keep your lawn looking neat and trim with a Craftsman 2-Cycle 17-inch gas string trimmer, now $20 off at just $119. Whatever's still on your to-do list this Labor Day, do it right for less. Start with Lowe's. Offers valid through 828. Soil offer excludes Alaska and Hawaii, U.S. only.